and that night there was rejoicing. Next day, the festival. A gala spirit transforms the scene, and from the hop festoon platform, the traditional opening ceremony is performed. First of all, I want to say what very great pleasure we have in having this hop festival again. And each year, it seems to grow in importance, and we like to think it'll develop until it becomes a real national festival worthy of our national beverage. On this fine September afternoon, there were sports and amusements of every kind for every age. That evening, entertainment in full measure. Open-air dancing beneath the floodlit oast houses. Firework displays and stars from the West End stage to join in the fun and mix with the good folk. But the immediate interest was the arrival of the winners of the beauty contest, one of whom will be chosen by the judges as the Hop Queen of the Year. Another hop-picking holiday is over. Another cycle of hop-growing is about to begin. Year after year, the Kentish gardens yield their harvest. So, until next year, goodbye, goodbye. So this is Shep and Neem. We're here in Faversham. Shep and Neem is Britain's oldest brewery. We've been brewing on this site since 1698. In fact, we've just unearthed evidence recently that we go back to before then. At one time, there were 60 brewers in Kent. Now, sadly, we're the only one of any appreciable size. We're very proud of Kent. We only use Kent raw materials to make beer. We only use Kent barley from close to Dover. Obviously, all of our hops are Kent. We use uh, water from a well, which is directly beneath the brewery. We are a medium-sized brewery uh, in this country. We brew uh, over 200,000 barrels of beer every year. A barrel of beer is 288 pints. If you'd like to work that out, that works out, I think, about 50 million pints of beer every year. Uh, if you want to turn that into hectolitres, we're brewing about 350,000 hectolitres of beer in a year. The next film, Brewer's Art, is a wonderful, almost encyclopedic look at the business of brewing beer. Based around the Whitbread label, this film looks at every aspect of brewing beer, right from the cultivation of crops, the brewing process, making of barrels, the bottling of beer, and the distribution of beer around the UK and further afield. Filmed in 1950, this is a film to enjoy and savour every bit as much as the pint on which it concentrates. Over 200 years ago, Samuel Whitbread came out to London from the little village of Cardington near Bedford. And after being trained as a brewer, 
struck out on his own and founded the brewery in Chiswell Street. Fifty years after its foundation, the brewery became unparalleled in Europe and was described in contemporary guidebooks as one of the sights of London. Its fame reached the court, and in 1787, King George III and Queen Charlotte were conducted round it on a tour of inspection. Indeed, few business houses are richer in their historical associations. The very corridors and cellars seem to echo the footfall of the great men who have worked here. What? Smeaton, Rennie, and Pasteur. Through this, the original doorway of the partner's dwelling house, generation after generation of the family entered the brewery to guide and shape its fortunes. Today, the brewery stands on the self-same site, almost in the shadow of St. Paul's. In the span of 200 years, it has been much enlarged, for it now occupies some six acres. It is the only brewery in the city of London. First then, let us see how Whitbread's beer is brewed. Beer is an extract of malted barley, boiled with hops and fermented with yeast. It's made from nature's own materials. It is essentially a country product, and barley is its backbone and substance. After early spring ploughing, the barley seed mixed with fertilizer is drilled into the soil. The best barley for brewing is frequently grown within reach of sea breezes on light land as here near King's Lynn or in Suffolk or Lincolnshire. As the months pass, the barley ripens, brought to maturity by the nutriment of earth and sun. The crop is anxiously inspected as the time for harvesting draws near. Only a farmer knows how critical and difficult is the decision when to cut or combine. Now is the moment. Once the barley is ripe, no time is lost before the grain is reaped, threshed and bagged, or pours in a golden stream into trucks waiting to take it away for winnowing. Barleys for malting may be purchased in London and other industrial centres, or again in the market towns adjacent to the barley growing areas, such as the old corn exchange at Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk, where farmers and dealers from neighbouring counties have gathered for the last hundred years. Only the best barleys are fit to be malted for Whitbread's beer. Whitbreads have their own maltings, in Norfolk, at Kings Lynn, Dereham and Whittington, and in Kent, at Canterbury and Wateringbury. On arrival at these maltings, every sack of barley is opened and examined before the barley is emptied down the chute to be dried, screened and rested. The first stage of the malting process is to soak the barley in liquor, as water is paradoxically called throughout the industry. It is steeped in tanks for about two to three days before being dropped to the floor below. The moist grains are then spread out on the malting floor in regular heaps. This is where germination begins. The temperature is controlled through a series of louvers to keep it the same during summer and winter as malting goes on all the year round. The barley is turned regularly for five days and then is moved to another section where turning continues to keep the temperature down to about 55 degrees. After three days, the steep is ready to move on to the next and last section before kilning. Full germination has now taken place and each barley corn has about half a dozen rootlets. Further growth is stopped by drying the plants off and lightly cooking them on the kiln. The mat of rootlets is removed by sieving. About the same time as barley is being sown, there is activity in the hop gardens. The wires and poles which support the hop vines are being serviced in preparation for the year's growth. In England, hops are grown principally in Kent, Sussex, Worcestershire, Hampshire and Herefordshire. But Kent remains their traditional home. Whitbreads grow their own hops, hundreds and hundreds of acres of them, in the fertile strip of the Weald at Paddock Wood. Their gardens bear a reputation second to none for the quality of the hops and for the conditions under which their pickers work. Many miles of string are used every season, laced between hooks in the ground and overhead wires 
to form the familiar symmetrical pattern of the hop garden. And all this to catch a flavor. The hops ripen and the grower becomes more and more watchful as the time for picking draws near. At the beginning of September, examination of the ripe cones indicates that the crop is ready for picking. Could any orchid rival this exotic luxuriance? And so the great army of pickers from London's East End starts its annual invasion of Kept. Hop picking is a family tradition. Year after year, the same families come to pick the harvest at Paddock Wood. This old lady has been coming to the hop gardens for nearly 60 years. Conditions today are very different from what they were when she was a girl. Now the pickers live in clean huts, hot water laid on, shower baths, kitchens and shops on the spot. Everything is done for their welfare during their three weeks working holiday in the garden of Kent. Hops must be dried immediately after picking. In the oast houses, they are spread on the porous floor through which heat passes from below to dry them. It may take as long as 12 hours before the dried hops have turned out onto the cooling floors, ready for pressing into long sacks known as pockets. With the arrival of Malton hops at the brewery, we are now ready to see how beer is brewed. Note, if you please, the system of expert control and careful checking that takes place at every stage in the process. Nothing is left to guesswork or chance. Before being shot into the miller's hole, samples of malt are taken by a kind of harpoon which can penetrate the sack to any depth. From the miller's hole, the malt is carried by elevator to the malt tower. There are many different kinds of malt, light, dried and delicate for pale ales, dark and roasted for mild ales and stouts. Here, a duty brewer checks that the malts have been weighed and measured accurately and that the correct blend is in fact charged into the hopper above the mill floor. There are four mills on the floor, two on Peter's side and two on Joe's side. Peter and Joe were masters of their craft and ruled the mill floor generations ago. Samuel Whitbread was always on the lookout for new methods to increase efficiency and to secure the most up-to-date plant, he recruited the foremost engineering genius of his time. Thus, he commissioned James Watt in 1785 to construct a steam engine with his new sun and planet gear to grind the malt and pump the liquor. Watt's engine, the first to be used in a brewery, continued to function for over a century when it was removed and presented to the Museum of Technology in Sydney. In design, it is similar to the engine you can see today at the Science Museum in South Kensington. In grinding, the malt is not crushed to powder, but is just cracked. And as grist, it is conveyed to the mash tun on the floor below. In the bright copper dome vessels of the mash tun stage, the grist is mixed with hot liquor. It is in the mash tuns that the nature and quality of the beer are largely determined by the blend of malts used and the temperature of the liquor. A duty brewer is always present at the start of each mash. After about two hours, the wort, as the infusion is called, is run off and hot liquor is sprayed or sparged over the grist for about four hours. The second and weaker wort, the second cup of tea as it were, is then drawn off. The wort flows to the underback where samples are taken to make certain that the strength of the wort is being maintained as brewing proceeds. The wort now flows to coppers where it's boiled with hops and it is from the boiling in these giant cauldrons that you get the characteristic smell of a brewery. The hops are carefully measured out for correct blending is essential and the quantity of hops used varies with the beer to be brewed. After about an hour's boiling the hopped wort is strained and pumped to coolers where its temperature is reduced to about 60 degrees. Between each brew, washing, cleaning and scouring of tons, coppers, pipes and vessels go on all the time. Each and every one must be spotless before use. 
Although yeast is so important in the brewing of beer, it's not strictly an ingredient. It adds nothing to the substance of the beer and is removed long before the beer reaches the customer. Yet it is the vital agent in fermentation. It transmutes the flat wort into a sparkling drink. As the wort is flowing into fermenting vessels, some is drawn off to mix with the yeast so as to make it fluid for pitching. The wort pours into the squares, as the fermenting vessels are called, and is thoroughly roused to mix with the yeast. The squares fill and samples are taken by the wort runners at frequent intervals. The transformation scene starts as the head on the wort rises. Even at this stage, the head of a pale ale to be looks quite different from that of a mild or best ale, which in turn differs from that of a stout. Here, the head of the yeast may rise to a height of three to four feet. From these squares, the wort is dropped to others below them, where fermentation continues for another four to seven days before the yeast is skimmed off. Brewing completed, the pale ale flows by gravity through the vast system of beer mains directly into tanks in the underground cellars. The best ales and stouts flow first into a bulk priming plant to receive an addition of sugar in the form of a syrup before they too pass to the storage tank. These tanks are the modern counterpart of the six great storage systems designed by John Smeaton for Samuel Whitbread. Smeaton's chief claim to fame was his construction of the Eddiston Lighthouse, the stump of which still stands beside the present light. The largest of Smeaton's tanks held 3,600 barrels. In the words of a contemporary, the great vessel at Heidelberg is nothing to it. Draft pale ale or bitter has a small quantity of the finest hops put into the casks at racking. This treatment with hops in the cold enables the flavor to develop gradually as the beer matures in casks and the full value of the essential oil of the hop to be obtained. Now comes the final and supreme test. A barrel of beer from each guile or brew is placed on the stillage in the head brewer's control room for daily testing and examination. All these tests are necessary because the head brewer has not only to satisfy himself that the beer is of the right quality, but he has also to decide when it is ready to go out. Beers are kept in the control room for some days to simulate conditions which might occur in an ordinary public house cellar or where beer is offered for sale to the public. Thus, the brewer is able to ensure that the beer will be in perfect condition when it reaches the customer, always assuming that proper care is taken of it at the other end. The brewery requires to maintain in use for its draft beer trade 100,000 casks of varying capacities, from the neat pin to the massive hogshead. The continuous replacement and repair of these huge stocks are carried out in the cooperage. Although cask-making machinery is now part of their equipment, coopers are trained to work by eye, without blueprint or measuring rule, and their craft is one of the oldest and most honored in the world. In 1948, an apprentices' school was started in the cooperage at Chisel Street, where the boys are taught all the rudiments of the craft, graduating in their fifth year to the main shop. Their curriculum includes the correct use of tools and a day a week at a continuation school. The ceremony of an apprentice's initiation into the Society of Coopers, or trussing the cooper, follows a ritual handed down from the 14th century. The apprentice is bundled into a cask of his own making and has sawdust and shavings sprinkled on it. Then he's rolled round the shop hauled out and tossed in the air by his tormentors. His ordeal over, the now fully-fledged journeyman Cooper receives the congratulations of the company. Whitbread started to bottle beer in 1868 in Finsbury. But so popular did bottle beer become that they had to remove the very next year to the present and larger premises in Gray's Inn Road, once the home of Madame Tussauds' waxwork shop. Whitbread's tankers deliver bulk beer to their own bottling stores. Here, the beer is first pumped to receiving tanks to be chilled and carbonated. Bottled beer must be very bright, so it's polished by being passed through a series of filters which remove every speck of sediment 
and deliver it clear and sparkling to the bottling machines. From unloading banks, the crates of empties are placed on conveyors which carry them to washing machines. It's washed, filled, sealed, and back again on the loading bank to start on a new journey to bring refreshment to someone. A beer bottle has to be clean, really clean in the medical sense, as sterile as a surgeon's instrument. Beer is a living thing and it's liable to start working again if it comes into contact with the moulds and wild yeasts which exist everywhere, even in the air itself. The merest trace of dirt on the inside of a bottle would turn the beer cloudy and soon make it unpalatable. So you can be quite sure that Whitbread's beer is bright and pure. After this thorough washing, the bottles are sent along a conveyor. The elaborate system of control which we saw in operation at the brewery is continued throughout. As they pass the cider, they are inspected for flaws against a bright light. Any chipped or cracked bottles are at once rejected. This 50-head automatic bottling machine fills 900 dozen bottles per hour. Immediately after filling, the bottle is capped by the crown corking machine, which seals a quarter of a million bottles a day. An amazing figure when it's compared with the old method of corking by hand with the boot and flogger. The bottle was held in the boot and the cork rammed in with the flogger. It's not surprising that three and a half thousand bottles a day was a record. Now here are the bottles which we 